So, hi everybody, and welcome to another episode of our space podcast, Al Khalal. Today we have a great privilege to talk to Mr. Nova Spiva. Nova is an American entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and author. He's also the co-founder and chairman of the Art Mission Foundation, which we're going to talk about today. So, hi Nova, thanks for joining us. Thank you. You are... Uh, I, I went over your bio and, and it's pretty long. And I saw that you built dozens of companies and some of them even did an IPO and acquisitions by Apple and Facebook and Samsung and Disney. Um, and of course, from all of those, the ones that I, that kind of popped to my face that I like the most is Zero G because I even managed to do that once. So you were one of uh, the, the founders? No, not the Who's founders. One of the in it, yeah. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. I, I was one of the early investors. Oh, one of the early investors of Zero G. Yeah. So, for whoever doesn't know, Zero G is an American company that uh, enables you to get on a plane and fly and do uh, zero gravity, wow. which is pretty cool. Um, when did when did you uh, become a space geek? When did all of this uh, Well, I got interested in space when I was uh, pretty young, partly probably because of my name, uh, just got me interested. And then uh, I, went, uh, I went to space um, in, a, uh, in a, um, a launch uh, when I was young. I went to a, oops, sorry, I went to a shuttle launch when I was young. And, um, and from there it was kind of, that's, that's kind of how it all began. So yeah, my, my grandfather actually consulted to NASA. Oops. I'm trying to set up this. I'm sorry. Just trying to get the phone to not move. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. It could be better? It could be But, better, yes. <laughs> okay, hold on. Let me, let me see what I can do here. Give you a better setup. I'm, I'm traveling, so it's just a little bit of a difficult uh, situation here. How's that? Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. So, so like, how, how old were you back then? Oh, uh, I was pretty young. I must have been about... probably 10 or 11 and I went to a shuttle launch and that's kind of what got in the first place yeah and uh saw that and then uh you know after that I no, I, I there. sorry about that that's okay um and okay so a few years forward and we're at 2016 and you co-found the art mission foundation which we're going to talk about. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the, the, the foundation itself? Why, why you founded it? What's, what's the, the goal of this foundation, the vision? Absolutely. So, um, you know, it actually started when I was young. Uh, I had a dream one night about uh, the end of civilization. And uh, in the dream, I, there was like an environmental catastrophe And we all had to live underground. And then finally, you know, we came out many, many years later and it was kind of an ice age and we had to rebuild. So I had this dream when I was really young. And uh, after that, I always think, well, we should do something to prepare and to try, you know, put something in place um, to protect civilization. That. Just, and a so, minute, just a minute, try. I'll stop you. Egal. Please mute yourself and please, people that join, mute yourself because it's very hard to hear. Sorry about that. No worries. Yeah, so when I was young, I had this dream. Um, it was a very unusual dream about the end of civilization. Um, and there was a kind of ice age environmental problem that, that caused everybody to have to live underground. And, uh, and then after that, we came out from underground and had to rebuild civilization. And in the dream, as part of that, we decided we had to make a kind of book of all the knowledge that we had, the last generation that had been alive in the previous civilization. So we made this book of everything we knew. So later, after um, I had done several companies, this idea kind of came back to me. And I thought, well, let's see if we can store our knowledge in a safe place. And so in thinking about, well, what would be the ultimate safe place? We decided, well, let's put it on the moon. because it's off world, you know, it's an off, it's an offsite backup. So uh, we started this foundation, a nonprofit called the Arc Mission Foundation to store these archives uh, in multiple locations around the solar system. 
sort of offsite backups in many places. Uh, that's kind of uh, what led to us starting this. And so uh, we formed a nonprofit and then we began to look for a storage media that would be capable of storing data on the moon. Okay. Um, which what is kind, What kind of data or knowledge do you want to store there? Well, everything, everything we can get. Um, but we started, our first goal was the Wikipedia. That's what we began with. Uh, so, you know, we were looking for a technology that would, that would enable us to preserve the Wikipedia on the moon. And the problem is you know, the moon is a very harsh environment. There's high heat. It also gets very cold. There's a lot of radiation. You know, there's all these different challenges. And so um, all of the storage media that we found, um, whether it was, you know, um, just standard DVDs or, um, you know, uh, uh, removable solid state storage, uh, USB keys, none of these things could survive on the moon for very long. Maybe, maybe they could survive a month, you know, but not, not centuries or millennia. So where, where the main issues probably are the temperature and the radiation, the radiation from the sun. Yeah. The radiation and the temperature are big challenges. Uh, the temperature changes also. So it's not only that it's hot or cold, but that it, you know, lunar day night cycle, it transitions pretty extremely. Yeah. Um, so most of these kinds of materials will end up cracking from the changes in temperature um, or the radiation will damage any of the data. Uh, and so, you know, because of that, we kept looking and eventually uh, we found uh, a technology where they were etching the data into quartz crystal, uh, as well as another technology where they were etching it into nickel, solid nickel using nanolithography. So those two technologies actually are capable of, of surviving on the moon. So we settled on that. Uh, yeah. Wow. I, I, you know, when I started reading about what you guys do, I, I kind of remembered the uh, time capsules that people used to build or still are building in the past, probably a century or two, where they put some kind of a knowledge or data inside a capsule, whatever size or um, or, you know, and, and they put it somewhere and they say, I'm going to open this in like 20 or 50 or 100 years so that I can look back at what happened back then. And then there are other types of capsules, like the ones that were sent to space with the Voyager spacecrafts, where maybe the idea there is not for us to open it in 100 years, but for somebody else, maybe to find it and understand that we are here on Earth. And you guys are doing something a bit different, right? So you're trying to you're trying to save and archive knowledge that we have for ourselves, but for what what reason? So it's it's archiving it for ourselves in case we ever need it. It's a backup strategy. So it's not so much a time capsule just for the fun of it, but really it's a, it's a backup strategy. And so um, you know we're we're trying to archive these in in different locations. Uh, the moon was just the first one, but also on Earth and in other places in the solar system. So the idea is to have redundancy. Um, so many copies in many places, but also to use a, a storage media that can actually last a long time. And then the other key piece of the strategy is um, that at least some of this storage is analog. It's not digital. So there are actually images of pages of text etched it at nanoscale into the storage media so that you can see with a microscope. Uh, so it's, it's like microfilm or like microfiche, um, but it's made out of nickel or quartz. And then after the analog layers, and the analog layers teach you how to make a computer so that you can get the digital layers. Oh, wow. So that's like data for in case that anything happens here on earth, uh, either be it, a, I don't know, a big asteroid or Correct. Uh, or a big war or something, and most yep. of us are not here anymore, so that the people that survive have the knowledge and the technology, and they can build a civilization again. Yes, they have our records. So there was a study done, a NASA study, um, that looked at a couple thousand civilizations from history. It found that the average age of a civilization is just about 300 years, um, and they typically perish after that. So our civilization is really at that point now. And we can see a lot of the signs of collapse taking place. Um, so 
you know, we're right on schedule actually for a collapse. Um, but the other difference is that um, where many of these previous civilizations, they lost a lot of their records, right? A lot of the records um, are gone. There are a few that remain um, and those were typically in stone or metal um, or, or ceramic. And so, you know, those strategies of long-term preservation are what we're using as well. We're using stone, which is quartz, right? And, and, and metal, um, because that last stands the test of time. Um, but the other reason that we're doing this is not only that civilizations collapse because of their own internal forces, but also um, there are geological forces, um, whether it's, uh, you know, climate change or, um, you know, earthquakes, floods, uh, temperature changes, climate change, um, but then also, of course, asteroids, comets, uh, you know, um, x-ray pulses. There's lots of different um, things that seem to kill off life on earth. And you can look at the record and see that it happens you know, re with regularity on the million, million plus year timescale. And we're actually overdue uh, for one of those events right now. So again, it's another reason to do it. So the 300 years that you said, what, how does that happen? Well, they, they just studied this. They studied all these civilizations that, they, that are known and found that on average, about 300 years was the lifetime of a civilization wow. before it one reason or the other collapsed, whether it was war, political conflict, famine, you know, there are different reasons, but on average, they lasted about 300 years. So, okay. yeah. I, I hope we're more on the 3,000 than the 300, okay. <laughs> well, I mean, one of the things that we're trying to do is, is change that. And, and part of that is by doing things to prevent collapse or in the case of a collapse to enable more rapid rebuilding. Um, and that, this was also inspired by the Isaac Asimov Foundation Trilogy where they predicted a collapse, they knew a collapse was coming, uh, and what they were trying to do was, was soften the blow to actually um, make it a shorter time frame uh, between the collapse and rebuilding. Instead of it taking 30,000 years to rebuild, uh, it would take 1,000 years. Interesting, so you kind of copied the idea from the books. Yes, <laughs> yes, their books were biggest. And the first project you guys did back in 2018, is with uh, SpaceX, right? With Elon Musk's uh, Tesla car. Yeah. Can you yes. tell us what, a little bit about that? How, how did that come to life? Yes. So what happened was um, we, we found this technology using quartz crystal um, out of a laboratory in the UK. And they had found a way to use uh, a femtosecond laser to etch uh, data into inside quartz crystals. So uh, the the advantage of this is it's very stable. The crystal itself is very stable and it lasts, the, they predict the, the data would last for 14 billion years, which is the age of the universe. Uh, so it's an incredibly um, stable, long duration form of storage. Uh, and also interestingly, you know, quartz crystal is what's used in the windows of the spacecraft. So it's very good for space. Uh, so we located this technology and we, did, we decided, well, well, as a test, let's write the Isaac Asimov trilogy into the crystal. So that's what we wrote into this crystal. So we made five copies in these little quartz discs about this big. And, um, and then we decided, well, you know, let's just hang on to these in case someday we ever meet Elon, because we know these are his favorite books. Um, let's find out, you know, let's hold on to these and see, you know, if ever we run into him, maybe we can give him one of these as a gift. So a couple of years later, we were watching Twitter, just happened to be on Twitter, and we saw him tweeting that he was going to send his Tesla into space. So just at that moment, I said, well, why not? I tried and I, I tweeted back to him, you know, hey, Elon, we made these, these discs with the Asimov Foundation trilogy, the last 14 billion years. Why don't you take one to Mars with you? And, you know, he saw it and he wrote back and he said, yeah, that's a good idea. That, that's a good way to store this data. So we had this exchange on Twitter in front of all these people, you know, 20 million people or whatever. And uh, we got him to agree to do it. And then we had to actually get him to follow through. So then we had a long process of chasing him to try to get him to actually do this. I and mean, he said he would, but then to actually get him to do it was another thing. So eventually we found people who knew him and we managed to get to his office. Uh, and, you know, we made this whole presentation. We made this special stand where the you open it and the crystal comes up and it turns and it's like this very fancy 3D printed stand we made with mechanism and you know whole PowerPoint presentation and all this materials and we were waiting in his office and he was really he was busy in other meetings so we ended up waiting and waiting and waiting and like a couple hours go by 
nothing happens. Finally, his assistant comes out and says, okay, he's ready. So they bring us in and he's like sitting at this little desk in this cubicle. I mean, there's just nothing, nothing special. It's like a cubicle. There's nothing, an empty desk. And he's just sitting there like going crazy on his phone, right? We're thinking he must be on Twitter. Um, so he's probably like on Twitter doing nuts, you know, crazy stuff, tweeting to people. And um, he doesn't look up at all. And we just sit there. We Actually, you don't sit, we're standing. There's no chairs. We're standing. He's sitting, we're standing. We're kind of awkward, like, well, he's tweeting away. And this goes on for like, I don't know, 20 minutes. Just like, da -da -da -da. we're just standing there like, ah, uh, with our thumbs. And we have our whole presentation. We're like, uh, what should we do? Finally, he looks up. And he's like, who are you? What are you doing in my office? I'm busy. I don't have time for this. Get out. <laughs> That's what he says. It's like, get out. We're like, but, 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 you know, we brought our whole presentation. We, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, I don't have time for this. Get out of here. Like, I'm busy, you know? And we like, so we say, forget about the presentation. We don't have, to, we obviously don't have time to do that. So I just pull out the disc and I drop it on his desk and I open it up and the mechanism and comes out the crystal turns and i said this is the foundation trilogy and he's like what it's on that i'm like yes it's it's actually to this crystal he says really how do you do that and we say well if you can get a microscope we can show you but we didn't have one so we had a little one we showed him he's like looking at it and we're holding it up to the light he's like looking in the inside the crystal is a little dvd you can see it etched inside really tiny uh he says wow that's amazing so i said well you remember on twitter you promised you know you would take this to mars and he says well you know thank you but i'm just going to keep it and keep it in my library. I'm like, no, 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 no. You can't just keep it. You have to take it to Mars. I mean, we made this specifically to do this. You have to take it to Mars. He's like, no, no, I'm going to put it in my library. He puts it in his pocket. I'm like, what? No, no, no. Wait a minute. Hold on. You can't do that. So we, we decide, okay, fine. We'll make a deal. We'll give you another one. You have to take this one to Mars. You can keep the other one. So he agreed. Um, and so that's how we ended up getting that thing onto the Tesla. Uh, and then he took it up. You know, he actually missed Mars. The Tesla didn't hit Mars. It missed yeah. Mars. It's actually good because it's lasting longer that way. It's at least 50 million years we'll be orbiting the sun. Yes, it's orbiting between uh, Mars and the sun right now, right? Well, it's an asteroid belt. It's kind of out past Mars towards the asteroid belt. So it'll be out there for about 50 million years. And we don't know, it may be longer. It's not going to hit anything for at least 50 million years. We know that. OK, that's cool. No. I, think, I think the picture of the, that Tesla is one of the most iconic pictures today of space. Everybody knows I, that. Most iconic pictures ever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what an amazing, <laughs> amazing stunt, you know, one of the most amazing things ever. Um, and we weren't even sure we were going to be on the mission because they didn't even tell us. I mean, he said he would, but then it was like an information blackout. They didn't tell us anything. We got no information at all until the day of the launch when all of a sudden we're on it. How did you so know that, that you're there? We didn't know, except when we were watching the launch, all of a sudden they do this little video thing and they show the crystals. And they're like, mm -hmm. and hi, right, it's an Easter egg. And the Isaac Asimov Foundation etched onto this quartz crystal. We were just, wow, you know, we we're jumping up and down. We were totally excited. It was a really amazing day. So Elon Musk over here. <laughs> it, was, it was an amazing Elon Musk moment. And so, then, And then that year, 2018, you guys had another project, right? So after having this project on the car, you had another project. It's called the Leo Library, where you put a copy of Wikipedia on a cube set. Yes, um, with a company called Space Chain uh, out of China, we sent the Wikipedia into low Earth orbit um, on, a, on a CubeSat. Um, so, and so it actually orbited for a while. Uh, so that was an, another little test. Um, but that was really just the beginning of the really big stuff that came after. What was the goal of that test or that mission? It was just, it was just to put the Wikipedia into orbit for the first time, which okay. we did. <laughs> yeah, and then we also did another mission um, with Blue Origin. We sent a bunch of students, student essays and things up on a Blue Origin send and return mission. Um, so those were the first three missions. And, and the, the mission with the CubeSat, was that supposed to be like an initial, an initial mission uh, before some kind of a bigger mission with more like a constellation yep. of CubeSats? No, I mean, we, we actually had some plans and still have some um, for a longer term um, array of, of higher Earth orbit satellites that would carry this. Um, this was a first test. Um, you know, we were offered the space on somebody's mission, so we accepted it. Um, but of course, you know, CubeSats at their, at their orbit don't stay in space for very long. So it's not a long term archiving strategy, really. It was more of a, a symbolic gesture. Okay, just to say that if anybody has any questions, write them in the chat, and then when we get to the Q and A session, then we can go on with the questions. Um, from what I read, 
the uh, some of the ideas behind that CubeSat was that that specific satellite was a nod in a blockchain, and you wanted to have like a whole. Yeah, so that network. company, that company, Space Chain, is trying to do blockchain nodes in space, um, and so um, longer term, if they if they accomplish that, then yes, we we would have a sort of data replication onto these nodes. But this is all hardware, right? So it's not something that you can update. So if you have the Wikipedia up there, it's not updated. This version is static, yes, it's static. But longer term, the plan is to have a, a dynamic copy. Oh, how would you do that? Well, in that case, they would, they would be running a server, essentially, on a satellite. And then we'd be able to um, you know, update that remotely. OK, but, but that, in that case, it depends on the life of the satellite. It's not some kind of quads or something that is right. for millions of years. That type of application um, would, would just definitely depend on the satellite, which is why, ultimately, the moon is a better location. Either that or there are certain orbits, like the graveyard orbit, you know, which mm -hmm. are good places to stick things. Um, and also Lagrangian points or else another area that we're interested in. Graveyard orbit is an orbit that's a few hundred kilometers uh, further away than the geo uh, orbit yeah. where most of the uh, communication satellites are. And the Lagrange points are several, five points actually, between different celestial bodies in our um, solar system, right? Where you can kind of stick things and they don't kind of, they don't move because they're, of course they move, they're in orbit, but they're between um, the gravity of two different celestial bodies. So they're kind of stuck in space. Yeah, so, so we can things into these Lagrangian points and uh, sort of store them there and call storage. That's interesting. Now, and in fact, that's a good place to look to see if there's anything already there from anybody else. True. True. <laughs> um, and then if we, if we move one year uh, uh, forward, then we get, of course, to 2019, uh, where everything connects to, I think, this specific uh, podcast and, and, and the audience here. Um, 2019 is when you guys, uh, in cooperation with Space IL, actually flew a disk um, of the foundation on the on the better sheet spacecraft. Can you tell us a little bit about this? How did you guys, you know, hook together, and what was the project there? And then we can talk about what came out of it. Sure. So um, the Space AL mission was really the most exciting one, um, and there, um, you know, we made friends with uh, several of the founders, and um, we were able to raise some some sponsorship money uh, from some very generous um, Israeli sponsors, actually. Uh, the Tilly uh, Charney and her foundation, um, and they they covered the cost to do this, um, which was fairly expensive to build this particular payload. In this case, uh, it was 21 layers of nickel. Um, several, about four of them were analog etching, and then the the rest were digital. Um, and um, super thin. Each layer was thinner than a piece of paper, so we had to make them very carefully using this nanolithography technique, and then put them all together into one stack, which was exactly about the thickness of a, a DVD, but it was really 21 disks. Um, and this, in this case, um, each layer had different materials. So the top layer um, had larger etched images that you could see with the naked eye or with a microscope, as well as um, some logos and things like that. That's the cover. And that was really meant to say, OK, there's interesting stuff in here. Um, and it included uh, the architecture of the disks and what's in there. Uh, and then. There was the next layer was a space IL layer, which was um, the history of space IL, um, the history, all the history of Israel and the Jewish people, um, the Holocaust Memorial, um, a, essays of a hundred uh, famous people around the world that they invited, um, photos uh, and drawings uh, from children around Israel, um, and then uh, we also included. Uh, some Wikipedia articles about space IL and um, Israeli space and science and technology. We had an exhibition of Israeli science and technology uh, innovators throughout history and, and so forth. And so this layer was all about Israel and space IL. Um, and then the next layer um, is where we began the ARC mission content. Um, and so that started with what we call the uh, primer 
which teaches using pictures about a million concepts. So each image uh, shows various pictures and then it has little call outs to what those are in five languages. So for example, you might see a house and it would say, you know, house in five languages. And then you'd see, you know, a tree and a car and a person. And, you know, each of these would be labeled in five languages. So there's about a million concepts etched in little pictures. And then the next layer below that has a table of all known languages. So that was from the Rosetta project from Long Now. And it has every known language uh, with about a billion translations between them. So we start yeah. with the pictures to five languages. And then from those five languages, we connect to all known languages. So this kind of connects core concepts to language. Then below that, we have um, about 30,000 books covering every topic, you know, every library, every topic in a library, whether it was history, art, science, you know, literature, uh, philosophy, you know, every, every topic, uh, engineering. Well, what's the size of that? What do you mean, the size? Like the DPI or, you know, the resolution well, of what you the image there? We etch the images at about 150 DPI. Um, and on each layer, uh, we can store about 20,000. So we did a selection of the books in analog and a selection of the Wikipedia in analog. And then the rest was digital in the layers below, which store a lot more. So after we did this selection of books, then below, that's where the full library is. And that's where we have the English Wikipedia, um, part of the, uh, actually the Israeli Wikipedia um, in Hebrew. And, um, and then we have, um, we have all the books and uh, that, that whole library. And there we have you know, many special sections as well. Um, uh, David Copperfield put all of his magic tricks. You know, we had some funny things in there, like recipes for funny things like queso, which is this cheese sauce in Texas. You know, lots of silly, funny things, but a lot of very serious stuff. Of course, we had a whole library of all knowledge. Um, and then private libraries contributed by different groups and foundations the history of all the known time capsules, the Voyager disc, all of that was in there as well. So really a very com a comprehensive library of, of every subject, you know, hundreds to thousands of books on every subject, um, as well as the Wikipedia, the CIA World Factbook was in there. Um, you know, the Panlex project on languages, a ton of books from um, uh, Gutenberg, Project Gutenberg, and many other sources, um, the who internet. Who chooses, like in this kind of a project, who chooses what subjects are gonna be on it? Well, we, we didn't really wanna be responsible for choosing the subjects. So we took the Encyclopedia Britannica subject taxonomy and we put books on every subject in that taxonomy. Um, rather than, you know, we're not gonna do this subject, we are gonna do that subject. We chose every subject in a library and we had, you know, some number of, of books and articles on every subject tr to try to be comprehensive. Um, and, you know, we tried to provide multiple perspectives as well. So, uh, of course, there wasn't enough storage space to store everything we could have stored, but we tried to at least have a good sample uh, for each topic. And so the library has uh, digital layers. Each digital layer is uh, 4.7 4 .7 gigabytes, 4.7 gigabytes per digital layer. And each analog layer is 20,000 images. And so, um, you know, we were able to put quite a bit of analog, about 80,000 analog images um, of pages of text, plus then all the digital data. So it worked out to be about 30 million pages in total. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of information. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, how did this start? I mean, how did you guys get to know Space AL and get the chance to actually cooperate together? Well, we had some friends who uh, in the space field who were connected with them and that's how the introduction happened. And they did wanna make an Israeli time capsule to put on their mission. So we agreed we could do that with our, our technology. Um, and, um, you know, cause we have really the only technology that can do it in a durable way. Um, so, and we got a sponsor to pay for it and that sponsor, you know, contributed some funds to their mission as well. And so it was the combination of the sponsorship um, and the, the technology that we had um, that was a good fit you know, for the mission. And, and, you know, they were very generous and to give us the opportunity uh, to put this, you know, incredibly important payload on their mission. So, uh, yeah, we worked very closely and it was a very good collaboration together. It seems like it's a huge amount of information. I'm thinking of in the past, you know, information was stored in libraries, in books and libraries. How many books or libraries 
does that small disk contain? Well, I mean, it would be larger than your typical university library, um, but probably smaller than a national library. So, you know, it was probably not as large as the Library of Congress, but larger than most colleges um, in terms of content. And of course, we all know, sadly know, that uh, Bereshit didn't soft land on the moon. It kind of crashed there. And what many people didn't know, and I, I read about this when I researched the subject, is that um, <clears throat> a short time before the launch, you decided to put some of yourself on that disk as well, right? You put um, some so, you know, that the, the bear sheet, obviously, it, you know, it means in the beginning, right, from Genesis. Yeah. Um, so the whole idea was life, right? It's about life and the beginning of life. So as a little Easter egg, I should say, um, you know, we, we signed it, you could say a little signature. Uh, we put a little bit, a tiny, tiny bit of uh, the DNA from hair, um, just from the follicles of hair of, of 21 people, which was 25 people, sorry. Um, and uh, allegedly, uh, possibly some tardigrades, maybe. Although maybe. we're not really sure. We're not sure if there were actually any tardigrades. There might have been some tardigrades. You don't remember? Somebody, well, it's not that we don't remember. It's that we, we just can't be certain if there were any. You see, somebody gave us uh, something, a little one centimeter square piece of scotch tape um, that they said had some tardigrades uh, in the tape. Um, so we stuck that little piece of tape onto the disc um, as, a little, as a little signature. Um, however, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the media decided to have a field day with this, uh, you know, and it became a story went way out of proportion, you know, instead of one little piece of tape about, you know, this big, um, you know, it became, you know, buckets of tardigrades, <laughs> and, you know, giant gallons of tardigrades, which of course wasn't true at all. In fact, we, we looked at the tape and we couldn't see any tardigrades at all but under a why, microscope. But why send tardigrades to the moon? Well, you know, in theory, tardigrades can, are, are very durable and can survive in space. And they have been sent to space actually other times before. Oh. So sending tardigrades to space is kind of a thing. You know, it's almost a tradition at this point. Um, and in fact, life on earth may have come from tardigrades that came from space originally. There's a theory in panspermia that they actually came to earth on, on comets from other planets. And that's what started life on earth. Um, so that's a theory, um, but in fact, um, you know, there are probably tardigrades already on the moon and on Mars because uh, comet impacts on Earth kicked up um, enough rock and material that uh, actually some of it would have hit the moon and Mars, even from impacts on Earth. So there are probably tardigrades all over the solar system already, um, but it's symbolic. Uh, so we did it because, you know, it's the oldest known uh, form of life on Earth. And it's cute. And, it, and they're really cute and kids love them. And, you know, since this was all about children and, you know, doing something educational, you know, for science education, you know, it was a, it was just a little Easter egg, a little joke at the end. Uh, and in fact, like I said, we aren't certain that there really were any tardigrades. Uh, all we know is the scientist who gave us the piece of tape said there were some tardigrades in the toon state, which is in, in suspended animation. But again, they're microscopic and we couldn't see them. Um, and even when we looked at a microscope, we, we saw something sort of like dust, but we couldn't be sure. But we, we stuck that little piece of tape there just in case as a little signature. But, you know, it was about, you know, it was not even this big. So if it did have any tardigrades, they were invisible, microscopic, and uh, certainly they were not alive. They were not alive. Yeah. There was supposed, like the idea there is that they're supposed to be dormant, that they don't have water, right? Correct. They're dehydrated. They kind of go into suspended animation. And then if you rehydrate them, they can come back to life. Um, and in space, this has been tested. However, you know, nobody knows if they could survive you know, longer than a month or so. So we don't know. Yeah, so that, that, that's another question that I had because I, I'm guessing even if they can uh, live without water and then somehow get back to life when we put some water on them, on the moon, I mean, <laughs> that would be difficult. Like the temperature and the radiation. I yeah, I mean, you they could not... They not survive on the moon, not at all. I mean, maybe the Toon State version could could remain and, and later be recovered, um, but the radiation is not not a small thing. The radiation might destroy them. Um, the, uh, of course, there's no water, at least no liquid water, 
so you couldn't rehydrate them on the moon. So it, really, there's not much that tardigrades can do if they're there at all. Um, you know, if they're there at all, if there ever were any, um, they'd still be there and, you know, stuck inside the disc in a little piece of tape. Um, and, you know, someday maybe if they're ever recovered, somebody could try to rehydrate them. So technically, from what I understand, you guys didn't break any laws because there aren't any laws that prohibit sending biological matter to the moon. But I'm guessing you knew that space AL well, and the Israeli aerospace industries are it was signed. This way. Um, number one, um, there were no laws about this. Um, number two, um, so the moon was not a protected and is not a protected environment. And number two, for protected environments, the um, you know, the laws are about much larger quantities of biological material, like a kilogram, you know, and we're talking something here that wasn't even one gram. It was, you know, it, it was microscopic, right? Number one. Number two, we weren't even sure if there were any tardigrades. Um, so, um, and, and number three, it was just an Easter egg uh, that we never even meant to announce. Um, so, you know, and there is a tradition of little fun Easter eggs in certain projects, but let's, let's put this in perspective. You know, NASA uh, with the Apollo missions, left 98 bags of human waste on the moon. There were 98 bags of, of poo and pee on the moon um, sitting there forever. Um, and nobody seemed to be very upset about that. Um, you know, and certainly that, those did certainly exceed any limitations of, of mass and so forth, but they left those on the moon. And that's probably um, with a lot of bacteria. In it. Packed with bacteria, and, yes, and viruses and all kinds of stuff. Um, in this case, you know, we really didn't see any tardigrades. So it was more of a joke. It was just the idea that there might be some. Um, but yes, some people, some people uh, were a little upset um, because the media, the way they told the story was as if we had poured, you know, gallons and gallons of tardigrades, which of course isn't true, not, not true. Um, but, you know, it caused, it caused some embarrassment and, you know, it, it caused a little bit of a scandal because people thought that we, you know, like we contaminated the moon with giant herds of tardigrades, you know, roaming around, eating all the cheese. And, uh, you know, that, that image uh, conjured up scary ideas. Yeah. Well, there are movies about Nazis on the moon. So now there are tardigrades and, there as well. And, and, and what would happen if the radiation on the moon, you know, mutated the tardigrades and they became gigantic and then they came back and invaded Earth, you know, these, these things are scary. So um, people who don't know science got, got quite concerned. I'm guessing that the Israelis and the Americans, they kind of, after discussions, the Americans understood that Space IL and the uh, Israeli aerospace industries had nothing to do with it. They didn't know anything about it. But what about, you and, what about you and the US government? Where is that? No. Actually, I mean, when we when we explained to the various officials that, you know, what we really had done, which was nothing, basically, I mean, it was less, if there was anything, it was less than the ink in a ballpoint pen if you signed your name on something, right? Very, very small. Nobody cared. I mean, they said, oh, okay, this is nothing. It's just a joke, right? And so everybody got over it. There were a few people who, you know, policy folks who, you know, decided to try to make it a, an example of space policy and planetary protection. Um, but they were barking up the wrong tree because it doesn't apply to the moon anyway, right? I mean, yeah, maybe if it was Mars, perhaps. Um, but in this case, you know, the moon is not a protected environment. And, and we've crashed all kinds of spacecraft on the moon, contaminated the moon with hydrazine and all kinds of very toxic things. So the, the, the idea that this somehow contaminated the moon was a specious, you know, fallacious argument to start with. Um, but also because the alleged quantity was literally, you know, microscopic. It just, it was a non-issue. It was more just that the press went haywire and that was embarrassing. However, and you know, although um, this, you know, certain authorities didn't have a sense of humor about this, uh, a lot of other people thought it was really funny um, or actually really cool. And uh, kids and teachers and uh, science educators uh, and, and, uh, and researchers all over the world loved it and they continue even today to tweet about it every single day every day you see it and there's pictures and art and memes so you know in the, in the long run space ale crashed and it would have only been remembered as a crash um, but now you know we put the lunar library there and 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 we think that actually survived the crash because it was made of nickel and uh you know it's stronger than a black box in an airplane very likely to have survived the crash actually we did a big study 
um, estimated the temperature and the energy of the crash, and it wouldn't have been sufficient to destroy the nickel. So it's possible, maybe even likely, that that disk is still there somewhere on the moon near the crash site. Um, there never really were any tardigrades, and even if there were, I don't think they would have survived. Um, you know, the idea survived. Um, but that idea, part of it was to draw attention to the, the library so that someday in the future, people might be curious and go back and try to find it. Um, but, you know, I think the controversy died down when people realized it was really just not, not an issue, really. Um, and, you know, looking back on it now, uh, it's one of, it, you know, it's one of those moments in early space history that people will remember. And Space IL might not have been remembered if that didn't happen, because it was just a crash. Would you do it again? Uh, probably not. Um, if I did that, if we decided to send any kind of life, uh, we would certainly try to coordinate. It was a very last minute decision and maybe it was stupid, um, but you know, it was, it was in the tradition of, of you know, science jokes, uh, you know. So would we do it again? Of, no. The, the tradition of ask forgiveness, not permission. <laughs> yeah, correct. Uh, you know, there's a long tradition of um, fighter jet pilots, you know, buzzing the uh, control tower, you know, it was like that. Um, and it happened to be April Fool's. Uh, nobody seemed to notice when we announced that it was around the time. I'll just mention that. But, uh, you know, we don't think space should be so serious. It's got to be for everybody. It's got to be fun. You know, you can't be so serious about everything. Um, certainly nothing that would endanger any mission. would ever, We'd never do anything like that. But in this case, it was really just an idea, you know, more right. of a joke. So moving on, yeah. Can you can you tell us anything about future projects of the foundation? Yeah. So uh, you know the the mission of the of the foundation is obviously to continue to put these backups in more and more locations. Um, you know to to replicate it in, and continue to send updates because the strategy succeeds based on the number of copies that we can put in in different places. And by putting enough copies in enough places, we can guarantee that actually, uh, you know, our civilization's records will never be lost. Even if a planet is destroyed, there'll be, there'll be copies in other places. So um, we have to continue doing this. And we do have several other missions. Uh, we have another version of the Lunar Library um, that's gonna be flying um, on Astrobotic uh, next year. And we also have something that will be flying um, with intuitive machines as well. Uh, and then we have some other missions that are, that are in the planning stages. And we also have some missions on Earth. We did a we did a test in a lava tube uh, earlier uh, last year to, to um, store um, a, a disk inside of a lava tube as a precursor to eventually storing one on Mars in a lava tube. So astrobotics to the moon and the next ones, like they're both to the moon. places where you want to, is it only there in the solar system or you want to send them out to the universe? Well, first the solar system. So there's two more lunar missions flying. Um, one is astrobotic and the other is intuitive machines. Then we have uh, some missions in the planning stages to different parts of the solar system. So um, obviously we'd like to get to Mars. Uh, we'd like to put some into Lagrange points. Uh, we would like to put at least one copy in orbit around each uh, major planet in the solar system just to make them findable. Uh, and then on Earth, we'd like to put them you know, in, on every continent uh, in deep locations, um, you know, underground, uh, for long-term storage. So we're working on all of that and over the next, you know, 50 years, hopefully we'll achieve that. So this is a, this is not a short project, right? This is a project for decades ahead. Well, and possibly lifetimes, um, you know, to continue to do this and keep sending copies, keep putting your, more updates because history doesn't end. There's always more. You always have to keep sending more. Can and we certainly, bit... Sorry? we don't want the uh, world to, the, the people in the future to think that, you know, our civilization stopped, you know, in, in, uh, in 2019. Yeah, fair enough. You talked about different methods of storing the information. And I wanted to see if there are any ideas for future methods of storing a lot of information. Yes. One of the technologies that we also uh, have been experimenting with is storage in uh, DNA using DNA to encode uh, data. And there's a number of different projects uh, experimenting with that. One of them is out of uh, University of Washington um, and another is from a company called Catalog. Um, and uh, working with both of them, we actually have encoded data, um, including the Wikipedia in DNA uh, with Catalog. And we actually uh, are sending that 
on an upcoming mission. And so uh, to store data using DNA, you actually use synthetic DNA and you, you combine it um, just like you would put ones and zeros on a digital disk. In this case, you're using ACTG um, and then encoding that with error correction um, so that later you can sequence it and extract the data. And the advantage of that is, uh, first of all, you can store a large amount of data in a very small amount of space, but more importantly is it's cheap, very cheap to make copies. And so you can have a lot of redundancy uh, to protect against any kind of loss of the data. But then how would the finder know that he needs to look inside the DNA? Well, um, the payloads contain visual images that indicate that there's knowledge in the DNA stored in a certain place on the disk. Um, and so there's a little area with some DNA deposited on it. Now, of course, they might not have the technology. So we have to explain all of that visually. Um, but we assume any, any civilization that's advanced enough to get to the moon can probably figure this out. Send them CRISPR with, uh, with that Send them like CRISPR. the whole package. <laughs> well, it's interesting because you know, DNA might be the common uh, data standard of biological life. We don't know yet what other life exists other than Earth, but on Earth, it is the standard. Um, and there is reason to believe that it could be the standard in other places as well. Um, so whether it's our descendants or some other form of life that comes to our solar system in the future, um, we think it's possible and maybe probable that they'll already understand what DNA is and how to sequence it. Okay. Now, now who is sponsoring this foundation? Because this is not, you know, the regular foundation. This is kind of a strange foundation. Yeah. So well, money? donations. Um, we have donations from a variety of, of donors, mostly small to medium-sized donors. We have a few larger donors. Um, but for the most part, everything that we've done has been purely nonprofit and driven by donations. So we're always looking for more. So if anybody listening is a, uh, a billionaire, um, please consider uh, supporting the ARC mission's long-term goal to back up humanity's knowledge. Um, it's, it's a very worthy cause and somebody's got to do it. Um, and it's the only kind of legacy that this planet will have in a billion years. So yeah, we're always looking for help um, and donations to do the work that we're doing. And it, it is expensive. It costs us roughly a million dollars per mission. I think that a lot of uh, Al Khalawi's listeners, our podcast listeners, are billionaires. So, you, know, well, you never know. I heard about your podcast. It was mostly billionaires. So that's why <laughs> I do the show. Uh, but yes, uh, if anybody would like to donate, it's, it's tax deductible if that's a, an issue. But um, yes, we definitely could use the help. Um, you know, the money goes towards making these discs and, and getting a load space. And I did, I did look at the um, list of. Uh, advisors that the foundation has, and I saw some, you know, uh, in, impressive names, interesting names, Stephen Wolfram and others, and then I saw David Copperfield, and I thought to myself, what the hell? Because you kind of told the story before. Well, yeah, so he's a friend of ours, and um, on our Space AL mission, uh, we sent all the secrets to his magic tricks, you know, how they worked, how he made the Statue oh. of Liberty here, how he made the 747 disappear. So he sent all the, all the secrets um, in a vault in, in the disk to be revealed someday in the future. Did you guys see them before? No, we didn't. Disc? No, it was encrypted. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I think we're kind of at that time where we are going to move to the Q&A, so we have enough time for people to ask questions. So let me open the chat over here. And see what we have. <clears throat> yeah, so um, Ophir Cohen is asking what about decoding of information? Do we need to collect it from space and decode it on Earth or wherever? We well, are? This, this particular copy of the disk you know, would have to be retrieved. It's a static copy etched into metal. Uh, so it would have to be retrieved at the crash site. Um, but if it was retrieved, uh, the first layer shows in larger images that there's something there. And if you look under a microscope, uh, in those first set of images are, are pictures that explain that there is data that shows what the layers are and uh, teaches you how to decode the data. So the, the images themselves can be seen with a microscope. And, the, and you don't need a very powerful microscope. Uh, it only needs to be as powerful as they had in the end of the 1700s. So not a very powerful mm -hmm. microscope, 
to read it. Um, and with that, you can read um, how to access the digital layers, which is the bulk of the knowledge. And that, of course, does require a computer. So it has to explain how to do that, which it does. Okay. And, and not all the capsule, well, not capsules, the disks, not all of them are going to be in space. Some of them are going to be on a celestial body, like on the moon or and, Mars. So. And also on Earth. Yeah. So um, we plan to put them in locations around Earth as well, multiple locations, so that they can be found in the distant, distant future. Sort of like, uh, you know, the Rosetta Stone, essentially, like an archaeological record mm -hmm. that we're leaving in the future. Uh, Amir Nave is asking a general question on space entrepreneurship. As an investor, what do you think are viable directions for companies in the coming five years? Things you would pra uh, practically invest in or expect to receive VC funding and have viable business models? Well, um, you know, some of the early applications are going to be around, um, I think, renewable energy. Um, for, for satellites, finding ways to refuel them um, or extend their lifespan. And so there's uh, a number of interesting technologies that are sending systems that can send refuel modules to, that can dock to satellites and give them more fuel. Um, another interesting opportunity is garbage cleanup to remove um, debris, dangerous debris, um, or to collect it and reuse it in space. Those are interesting. Um, power in general, communications in general, um, as we move towards uh, trying to set up a permanent base on the moon, um, there'll be, I think, a lot of opportunities to supply, um, again, you know, basic necessities to a manned base on the moon, whether it's water, food, power, um, bandwidth. Um, so we see companies sort of forming to try to do stuff like this. Um, manufacturing, obviously, is going to be an opportunity. Um, in the near term, I think you, we see a lot of activity around internet connectivity uh, from, to and from space. So th those are near-term opportunities, but uh, you know, I think um, less expensive and more environmentally friendly um, launch power mechanisms for fuel and, and propulsion, um, and then you know, extending the lifespan of satellites that are already in orbit. Um, and unfortunately, we also see a lot of weaponization taking place. So um, you know, we start we're starting to see the the, the military industrial complex also. Um, starting to act in space. Um, and so satellite defense, you know, is also going to be important. Okay. As a follow-up question, Amir is asking, many of the space endeavors in the past years are either initiated by self-funded billionaires who have the capital or by, or by government and government agencies. Do you think the standard VC model where a company begins with a few million dollars and needs to build technology and business from the ground up is viable in the American space industry. Are there any successful examples for this? Well, I mean, I, I think we still need a certain amount of government funding um, and even, even look at companies like SpaceX. Um, although it's completely privately funded, a lot of their big contracts are government contracts. So I think we're still gonna rely on governments and government contracts to, to provide commercial support. Um, at least in the beginning. Uh, it's, it's difficult. The costs of doing things in space are pretty high, and it does take many, many years to generate any kind of return, which doesn't typically fit the venture capital model, uh, which is usually a shorter term type of model. So I, I do think there's going to have to be government support uh, and that some of the revenue will have to come from government, at least until you know, we have larger, whether it's orbiting colonies or bases on, on the moon and so forth, um, that can generate sustained commercial demand. Uh, but in the near term, other than communications uh, and sort of military applications, um, I do think a lot of the funding still has to come from NASA, ESA, uh, and other government-sponsored uh, entities. So it's, it'll be a hybrid for a while, sort of like how the internet was formed, actually, with you know, DARPA funding. OK. Another follow-up question by Amir. Um... Do you think projects such as Starlink, Kuiper, and other large private satellite constellations are open to external additions and innovation from smaller companies, or do they usually operate in a closed company sphere? Or in other words, how open are these large corporates to external partnerships in your experience? Well, I, I guess I don't have a lot of experience on that particular question, but my sense is they're not very open. 
um, at this time, they're still pretty closed and, and proprietary and, and partly because they're just so new and they're trying to just stabilize what they're doing before they add any, any variables that, you know, could destabilize what they're doing. Um, I think the best kind of open platform is in the CubeSat model and, you know, sending things up to the ISS and, and launching CubeSats. But some of these larger commercial constellations are, I think, pretty closed and they, they probably will be for a while. Okay. Um... How does one find the backups? <laughs> well, um, you look for um, spacecraft um, because the, they would be in the spacecraft in these interesting locations. In the case of uh, the bear sheet crash, of course, you'll see the crash site, which would be interesting if you were viewing the moon from space. Um, the Tesla in orbit, uh, if you did a study of our solar system, you'd notice this strange thing you know, in this unusual orbit. Um, and so that should attract some attention. But um, the other thing we're doing is on every copy, we're putting a map with the locations of all the other known copies. So if you find one, it shows you where the other ones are. Mm. Okay, <laughs> that's cool. Um, are there any other questions? Anybody wants to unmute himself and ask? Okay, so if you do have any other questions later on, send them to me and I'll send them to Nova. Nova Spivak, I'd like to thank you very, very much for a very interesting talk. I think uh, the ARC Mission Foundation is doing something very extraordinary. And I just hope that you can keep on doing it without you know, getting into too much trouble. Um, but I mean, I spent some time in the States and what I learned is ask forgiveness, not permission. And hopefully when it's not something big, then it's okay. Um, yeah. So thank you very much. And thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for the great questions. If anybody uh, has long-term locations for ARCs, let us know. And uh, again, if you happen to be a billionaire, drop me a note. <laughs> we'll think about long-term. Uh... Oh, there's another question here. Where are you going to share the recording of the meeting? Um, I will upload it to the YouTube channel. So I will give uh, a link um, to the Al Khalal um, YouTube channel. And if the, um, if the sound is good enough, then we'll do a podcast uh, episode as well. I'd like to also thank our podcast team members, Aviad Man, the Superman, for all the great sound engineering that he does for us. By the way, if you're looking for a great sound engineer, who knows what he's doing, talk to Aviad. Big shout out to our master graphic designer, Itai Leon, not Don Cor Leon. If you need a top-notch designer, then Itai is the person for you. And a big thanks to Bennett and L for all the social networking. Bennett and L is cool, like Space IL. And if you want to surprise your friends with a very interesting talk about space, feel free to talk to me, reach out to me. I give uh, space talks wherever needed. And last but not least, I'd like to thank all the viewers and listeners, uh, because without you guys, all of this would be for nothing. So now you're more than welcome to unmute yourselves and thank Nova as well. Thank you for the great talk. I am Eyal Ben Zaev. And we'll see you in the next episode of Al Halal. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, see you later. Enjoyed it. <laughs>